Good morning. As you are able, would you please rise for the call to worship and remain standing for the opening hymn. Rejoice in our God always. Again I say, rejoice. To be present now and to know the joyful unity of being one with Christ. Rejoice in our God always. Again I say, rejoice. Amen. Please be seated. When we come to God in worship, we gather as members of a great community of faithful witnesses from across the world and over the centuries. Their examples give us courage and hope, courage to be honest with each other and with God, and hope that God's love will transform our lives. Let us join in the prayer of confession and renewal, followed by a time of silent prayer. Together, gracious, gracious God, God, giver, giver of, of all life, life you, you invite us to walk in your way, way to, to follow, follow your, your paths. paths. At, At times, times we feel like we are on our own. own. We, forget we forget how many have gone before us. us. Help us to remember that our faith is not, is not something we achieve on our own, but it is a gift from those who have witnessed to your love, to your love and, and grace. Open, open our eyes to see their contributions to our lives and our and hearts, hearts to share, to share them, them with others. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. God's anger is but for a moment. God's mercy is forever. Friends, we are free to live in love, for we are a forgiven people. Thanks be to God. Amen.
Let us welcome one another with signs of grace and peace. to welcome you all to worship on this uh, bright, beautiful, and sunny day here in uh, Palos Verdes, California. Um, although uh, we are gathered here in the sanctuary, we also gather across the country and around the world through the gift of digital worship and YouTube. So wherever you are, however we may be gathered, God's grace was already here before us, inviting us in. Those worshiping together for the first time, welcome to you. As we can be helpful, we look forward to doing so, and we're glad we can worship God together today. If you would be so kind uh, to share with us your names in the welcome pads there on the back of the pew in front of you and share those down the row with neighbors and friends, that would be lovely and helpful. I want to commend those of you who are here at the 8.30 service for being wise enough to get to church while it is still in the cool of the day. <laughs> Folks who come along later are going to be, uh, you know, sweaty and tired as a result of, of this wonderful summer weather that we are having. Uh, Clarence Fung is our liturgist this morning. Uh, he and his wife, Sue Ellen, have been part of our church family over many years. Clarence served with the United States Air Force and later at TRW. Uh, since his retirement, he's been a regular part of our club maintenance team and has volunteered for years with Habitat for Humanity as well. Glad to have you with us this morning. I also want to introduce uh, my longtime friend, uh, Robert Crawford, uh, a, a lieutenant colonel in the U.S. Army, a chaplain, a United Methodist minister, uh, so colleague as well as friend, uh, from the North Georgia Conference. Uh, he and I met at a conference in Pine Mountain, Georgia in 1994, um, played ourselves silly throwing uh, a, a Frisbee equivalent across a, a lawn um, that was large enough to accommodate our then youthful vigor um, and, and became uh, close friends. And, over the years, um, once Rob went into the army, especially, he was elsewhere. Um, he was in Germany uh, for many years, a couple of times, and in Iraq in between. And so it had been some time since we had seen one another in person. But then he came out to California and is at the uh, Joint uh, Force Operations Base in Alamitos and serving not only uh, U.S. Army, but uh, other uh, branches that are gathered under the roof there. And um, we are fortunate to have him here as April is away on well-deserved vacation. Uh, Rob Crawford, um, I'm glad to have the chance at last to work together after, you know, only what, 28, 30 years of knowing one another. So that is a joy. Um, the lovely flowers here in the sanctuary are given by two uh, happy couples, one Linda and Chad Fester in celebration of their 31st wedding anniversary, as well as by Don and Martha Tuffley in celebration of their 70th wedding anniversary. So um, they at least have made a good beginning and we want to see them doing well. Um, some of you may remember, others I'll be forgiven for, for not, but my I guess you could call it a rant in the uh, most recent issue of the Cornerstone um, in which I, I took on um, the forces known as Southern California Edison and, and complained about the timeliness of their help with us. And I want you to know that evidently the Cornerstone is more powerful than we knew um, because I wrote that on, well, you, it went out on email Friday, and some of you got it Saturday and Monday, and on Monday, the uh, member of their crew was here to install the meter, and it is in. And, and I now even have an app on my phone, which I can check the status, not only of the 
solar generation, but if you'll bear with me here for a second, um, what's happening between the solar panels, uh, which are on the other side of Wesley Hall, as well as on the office and the education buildings, um, the three Tesla battery wall batteries and the grid, and at the moment, um, we're using about 50 kilowatt hours of electricity. We're generating uh, about half of that, 27.4, um, and so we're drawing from the grid about 21, 22 kilowatts. Um, that's going to change over the course of the day as the sun gets higher and the shade of the trees uh, passes and we will be not only filling up the batteries but actually sending electricity to the grid. And yesterday we were, I think, like 82% self-generated. So that's in warm weather with air conditioners running um, and we are amazed at how well that is going for us. So, um, yay. <laughs> Better be careful about what I write next time. Now I'd like to invite the children to gather here at the front. I'm so glad to have you here this morning. I, I brought along with me um, something that I enjoy looking at from time to time. It's, it's a family photo album. And, and this one goes back, it goes back to when uh, our, our daughter Hannah, you won't be able to see it, but she was a little baby here. And, and in this picture, she's with a dear, dear friend and other family, my, my grandpa's younger brother and his wife who were both um, pediatricians, and, and then here's more of Hannah as a baby, here's her Auntie Azana, who was her godmother, and there are pictures here of um, my parents and of uh, Tira's parents, uh, uh, Hannah's grandparents on both sides, and, and then uh, there's a picture of Tira's grandfather, so Hannah's great-grandfather, and, and um, somewhere in here, I haven't found it yet, there's a picture of my grandparents, so pictures of Hannah's great-grandparents on, on my side. And the, the pictures just go on and on. And the, there's my sister and brother-in-law and Hannah's two cousins. And when you look at a family photo album, one of the things that you realize is we're not by ourselves. We're not really here on our own. There are all kinds of people in our lives, people who are with us now um, and people who used to be with us or even we never maybe even met some of them, but they're the reason we're here. Somewhere in here, I know I'm about to find it, there's a picture of Hannah with my grandmother, which they only got to see each other one time um, at, a, at a family wedding, and, and Hannah, I don't think she really knew that much what was happening, but my grandmother did. She was thrilled to get to meet her great-granddaughter and, and knew that, that our family was going to continue. And, and what a joy that was for her, and what a joy it was for me to be able to bring all those people together. Well, in the time of the, the Bible, people did not have family photo albums like this. They, they didn't have cameras. They didn't have the ability to take pictures and, and to share these with each other over years and years and years. What they had were stories. And so they told those stories over and over again, stories about their children's grandparents and great-grandparents and great-great-grandparents and great-great-great-great-great-grandparents and even those people's great-great-great-great-grandparents because they wanted them to know that in our lives we have all these people who are 
rooting for us. They've gone to be with God now. They are, are in, in a different place. We don't get to see them, but they get to see us, and they are cheering for us every day as we try to live out our lives and to be good and faithful and loving people. We're not doing this by ourselves. The Bible says, for we are surrounded by so great a host of witnesses. All these people who came before us, they are like, they're in the stadium, they're in the, 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 the Colosseum, they're cheering us on. And when we come running along in our time, when it's our turn to run our race, they are cheering and waving and shouting and jumping up and down because they want to see us do well too. The time will come, we'll get to be part of that group too, and we'll get to cheer on other people. That's one of the lessons we learned from our families is people have come before us and people will come after us and we'll be a part of their story too, and maybe even their family photo album. Let's have a prayer together. God, we thank you for pictures and stories of people that have known and loved you and have known and loved us and that your love holds all of us together, that we can encourage and cheer and help each other along the way. Let us know that wherever we go and however far we are running, that we are not alone. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you very much, have fun at Sunday School.
Jonathan says I can remove the mask for this purpose, so that I shall do. All right. Ah. So you can see my face now. Um, Maureen, Althea, thank you so much for sharing that. That's, that was my grandmother's favorite, I, I guess, hymn. It came out, I guess, as a, as, a, as a piece of popular music, and it's been brought into the hymnal. As, as That's a good Methodist thing to do. Um, I'm Rob Crawford, and I'm just taking take a moment at Jonathan's sermon time just to tell you a little bit about something that I'm very proud of and I want you to know is... is, is we share this great connection as United Methodists. So I know we're a community church, but we're also a denominational church. And, um, and I, my ministry is called an extension ministry because it is an extension of what you do here in your community. I am extended into the military community. Uh, military chaplains are fully endorsed clergy, you know, had to go to seminary, had to do the whole thing. I, I did 17 years in the local church before I got crazy and joined the military uh, right before 9-11. I thought, what are you doing? You know, the, uh, I didn't know that was going to happen, but, but I would have done it anyway, and I'm, I'm so proud. Now I've got 21 years in, and I'm getting close to retirement, but I am so grateful to you for your support and your ministry. United Methodist clergy walk among our soldiers, sailors, airmen, coasties, Marines, let me not forget anybody, uh, our civilian uh, DA employees, uh, we are there to provide ministry. And United Methodists are so free to provide the sacrament of Holy Communion. We are there to counsel and care for. We can do things a lot of the others can't do. And that's made possible because of you, because of your support, because of the giving you do, because of the endorsement we carry. And uh, we, we need more. So if you want to be a chaplain, uh, come talk to me. But. Um, <laughs> We need more Methodists, you know. But anyway, it's just, it's wonderful. And I'm so glad to be back here in the local church this morning. I know I have a specific job to do, and I'm going to do it. But I just wanted to tell you a little something about, about my work. So anyway, so the past is present. As, as a good friend of Jonathan and, and mine, our mentor, Ken Callahan, always said, uh, no deed done, within, done in love and in the Holy Spirit is ever lost. And, and let's not lose what we carry, that great heritage. So let us pray. Our gracious and eternal God, we thank you for the opportunity to gather this day as the body of Christ, the church. We thank you, O oh God, that we are indeed so surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. Witnesses who were not perfect. If we read the text, we see they were flawed human beings like us. But witnesses who are made complete in faith and whose completion comes as we become a part of that community. Lord, we are gathered, as, as he says, uh, we're being cheered on by those who have gone before us, and one day we will cheer those who come after us, for that's the great tradition that we share in Christ Jesus. Gracious God, as we gather as the church, we are reminded of the profound community of faith that we share, that we stand within stand near the altar of grace, we stand within the presence of the Almighty, 
and we are allowed to petition. And so we gather this day on behalf of ourselves and on behalf of one another. Lord, this day we especially remember those who are dealing with particular issues. There are many that we name in our hearts, known only to you, known only to you, O oh God. We lift up those who are struggling, those who are suffering, those who are making decisions. We lift up those who are sick, and we'll name some specifically in a moment. Gracious God, we pray for our great country. We pray at this time when we have so much division and so much frustration, so much diversity and good people struggling to come to terms with similar circumstances, those that are, Lord, help us to love each other, to look beyond divisions of thought and idea, to know that we are one. Lord, in our church, be with us as we deal with division and, and, and discontent and remind us that we are all followers of Jesus Christ. Make us one, one in our hearts. Heavenly Father, we pray this day for those in this community that need your special touch. We pray for Betsy, who is recovering from heart surgery. We pray for Bill, who is in hospice. We pray also for Kelsey and Ed, who are also in hospice care. Gracious God, we pray for Jane's sister, Diane, for Joe, for Stevie, for Pamela and Stanley, who are friends. We pray this day for Kathy and Andy, for Bill and Lucy, for Bob. Gracious God, we pray for Ann and John, for Ron, for Jill, for Arlene, for John. We pray for Bob, who is the father of Abigail. We pray for Ashley, and this day we pray for Kim all members of the household of faith, the body of Christ. Lord, may our prayer be a cheer for them as we encourage them in their time of need and struggle. Lord, let our prayers be more than just thoughts and words, but also emotions of our heart. Gracious God, we pray now that you would gather us and draw us into worship, that we might hear your word proclaimed. Be with Jonathan as he preaches be with our hearts as we hear, and be with us as we offer the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, power and the glory, glory forever. forever. Amen. Amen. We give thanks for the gifts that support our mission. Some are given here in the sanctuary, others online or by mail. We dedicate all these gifts now in prayer. Lord, you are the source of all good gifts and the fountain of blessing in our lives. We bring our offering, offerings in gratitude for your grace and love and ask that you use us to bring hope and help to others. Amen.
In the letter to the Hebrews, the writer recounts the history of God's people who faced and met great challenges to their faith. He wants to encourage those in our own time that they are following in a track well-worn by others and that these same people now wait and cheer for us to complete our stage of the race. Hebrews chapter 11, verses 29 through 12, 2, may be found on page 274 of the New Testament portion of your Pew Bibles. By faith, the people passed through the Red Sea as if it were dry land, but when the Egyptians attempted to do so, they were drowned. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell after they had been encircled for seven days. By faith, Rahab, the prostitute, did not perish with those who were disobedient because she had received the spies in peace. And what more should I say? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, obtained promises, shut the mouths of lions, quenched raging fire, escaped the edge of the sword, won strength out of weakness, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight, Women received their dead by resurrection. Others were tortured, refusing to accept release in order to obtain a better resurrection. Others suffered mocking and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned to death. They were sawn in two. They were killed by the sword. They went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, persecuted, tormented of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains and in caves and holes in the ground. Yet all these, though they were commended for their faith, did not receive what was promised, since God had provided something better so that they would not, apart from us, be made perfect. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and the sin that clings so closely and let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, who for the sake of the joy that was set before him endured the cross, disregarded its shame, and has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of God. Here endeth the reading of our scripture for today. It was Sunday morning, she said to herself. Who's going to get up early on a Sunday morning to see a bunch of women running? That was what she had in her mind and heart, and maybe it was because she had spent so much time in the last well, year especially, but longer than that, by herself training, running alone, mile after mile after mile, doing everything she could to prepare for this one day. And maybe it was because she had already been on her own for much of the morning. She was well ahead of the pack and so had been on her own for a while. And then there was a a stretch of the course, um, the Marina Freeway, the 90, uh, in which spectators were not actually allowed, so the, that part of the race, she was literally by herself. There was nobody that she could see anywhere around her. But as she came uh, closer to the destination, that was the Los Angeles Memorial Coliseum, she could tell that something was going on. Um, She was uh, Joan Benoit, and 
the occasion was the first Olympic women's marathon held here in Los Angeles in 1984. As she entered the stadium, she sensed something was happening, but she could never have imagined the reception that greeted her. A roar went up as she entered the stadium, the likes of which she'd never heard anywhere before, let alone in her running. There were thousands, tens of thousands, about 90,000 people who, it turned out, had gotten up early on Sunday morning to watch a bunch of women run. And the, the roar of the crowd just about knocked her off her feet. She, she remembered uh, thinking to herself, just put one foot after the other, or as she had heard uh, Bruce Jenner talking about his decathlon uh, effort some years before, the phrase, feet don't fail me now, came to her, and, and she managed to stay upright. It was an extraordinary reception that awaited her. The crowd was full of joy and wonder and awe and exuberance, and they were thrilled to see her enter by herself this wonderful stadium of good wishes and of high hopes. That's the image that the writer of the letter of the Hebrews holds before us. He speaks of the crowd of witnesses, the, the cloud of witnesses, the host of witnesses who are waiting for us to cheer us on. He writes to the uh, members of the early Christian movement um, to, to let them know that, you know, they're not alone. It, it may seem like it. There are times when we feel isolated and, and, and uh, separated from one another, separated from other Christians uh, in, in our community, and he says, no. He reminds them and reminds us of all those faithful persons who have run this race before us. Abraham and Sarah, Moses and Miriam, prophets and judges and kings, faithful women and men who in their own day ran the race that was set before them, and now they're waiting for us to finish. And they've taken their place in the stands, in the Colosseum, in, in the uh, stadium, waiting to see how we will do. Some of them face great odds. Some of them suffered terribly. Some of them persevered through challenges that they thought were beyond them and were sustained by the grace of God that brought them through those times. And so, uh, as, as we look to them, we are reminded that others have gone before and have faced challenges and struggles that were beyond them as some seem beyond us, and yet God saw them through. In a way, the stadium of uh, fans, of witnesses that, that the writer of the letter of Hebrews uh, describes are, are even more enthusiastic than the crowd that were there with Joan Benoit when she finished and won the Olympic marathon here in Los Angeles because at, at the Memorial Coliseum, even the most vocal of those fans who were there in the stadium were really spectators. You know, some of them might have run on their own, but uh, they were there as, uh, as audience, as spectators. Those in the stands in the letters scene 
are people who have actually run that very same race. They know what it's like for us to be where we are. And their support and encouragement is not based on just sort of a, a general enthusiasm, but of actually understanding and experiencing what we ourselves are going through. And so the roar that goes up for us is one that is well and truly based on knowing God's grace and love and being seen through the most rigorous of challenges. Some years ago, I read a, a study, a, a, a paper that was evaluating um, the uh, level of joy, of, of uh, uh, the satisfaction that was experienced by uh, Olympic medal winners. How did they feel about their achievements? Well, um, it may not surprise you to learn that the gold medal winners were actually fairly happy with their uh, accomplishment. But it was a little more complicated than that because while they had, they had done their best and done the best that anybody could at that time, for some of them, they, they only met their expectations. They, they, you couldn't do any better than that. They had, they had hoped to win a gold and they had won the gold, but that's what they and possibly others expected. Nobody exceeds that expectation and neither had they. The silver medal winners were actually not that happy. They had expected and hoped for gold, and, and they had fallen short. And so there was, you know, a, a silver medal winner in the Olympics had a sense of disappointment, of, of not having lived up to their potential, of having fallen short all of those hours, all of those years of preparation to come up just shy of what they had hoped would be theirs. I don't know if it will surprise you or not. It did me, but then it made complete sense. The happiest people among Olympic gold medal winners were the bronze medal winners. You know why? Because they had come this close to not meddling at all, and they now had something. I mean, imagine being the fourth place. I was almost there. I almost, I almost got a medal. Oh, really? Almost? Well, I have a medal. It's bronze. I was one of the top three people in the world in my event that year. What an amazing accomplishment. Some of them had not expected to medal. They had exceeded their expectations, and now they were over, over the moon, thrilled with what had been accomplished. What a wonderful gift they received. And, and why not? Therefore, let us lay aside every weight and sin that clings, and let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us. That's what the writer of the letter to the Hebrews invites us to, and it is an invitation. Let us. There's no scold there. There's no should or ought. There, it, let us run the race that is set before us, not you'd better run the race. You know, you have to run. You ought, you ought to do this. Get running. It's let us. And how do we do that? Let us lay aside the weights that we carry. Oh, could we do that? It would be easier to run, wouldn't it? Let's, let's take off the, the things that are holding us down, slowing us down, keeping us back, holding us from being able to accomplish all that God invites us to do and to be. Oh. Take that off and lay it down. 
and let us, let us run. Let us run. What a, what a joyful, hopeful invitation we receive. My favorite race ever, ever, because I did run, no marathons, well, one Boston Marathon for which I was not qualified and did not finish. I just ran with a couple of friends at the end. We ran a long way, but not all the way. My favorite race was in junior high school. And what I mostly ran in those days was the 880 because we weren't yet into cross country, which I later ran, but the 880, I wasn't that fast. I wasn't really that good, but in the 880, there are people who think they're fast, who start out fast, and they can't finish. So I knew that if I just kept running, normally I had a chance of, of doing okay, and I really enjoyed doing okay. But when the track meet was coming up, it was the Julian Invitational. So people were coming from other small mountain and desert towns to run there at our stadium. Um, when the time came to qualify, I was sick. And so I did not get to run the 880, my favorite race. I wasn't going to get to run at all. A week or so went by, and on the day of the race, somebody fell out of the 660. Somebody on our team was not going to get to run the 660. So I did. The 660, one and a half laps around the track, started on the far side of the field from where the stands were. And, and I didn't really expect to do all that well because I was still not 100%. I was still feeling how I was when I failed to qualify. And so when the gun went off, I mostly just was running the race. I was just putting one foot in front of the other and not stopping. And, and so came around the first turn, just, I don't know, near the back of the pack. And, and along that first uh, full straight, I, I must have passed somebody and, and I think I passed somebody else. And, and I wasn't really thinking about passing them, I was just running my pace and they were slower and so I moved around the side and then I moved back. And as I headed into the second turn, I, I actually was passing some people, like two or three or m more people. And, and so on the, the next full straight, there were a couple of people in front of me and I, I passed one of them. And, so heading into the last turn before the finish, I looked up and there was one person in front of me and he was my friend. And, and I, I wasn't like intending to beat him. It wasn't like some goal I had, but I was, I was running and I was, I was feeling good. I was, I was no longer feeling tired the way I was when I started out and I, I was feeling good. And so as I got up close to him, I realized as we were coming around that last turn, the shortest distance to the finish line was to go on his inside, to his left, to cut through there. But I also knew that he would see me do that. So instead, I went to pass him on the right, the longer distance, but one where he was not looking. He was looking to his inside. And so, uh, as we came out of that last turn, I was on his right, and I was a little bit ahead of him, and the crowd went wild. There weren't 90,000 people there. There were probably a couple of hundred, but they, they like, I understand what Joan Benoit experienced. Like, it was this incredible rise of sound and of, of excitement and wonder, and, and he heard it too. It actually kind of gave me away a little bit. And, and he looked over to the side and saw me a little bit ahead of him. And he had a kick that I did not have. And he won by a step. And ah, I can't tell you how good that felt. It was, it was so fun to finish that race in that way. Uh, I guess if there had been medals, there weren't. I would have been a silver medalist, but I would have been a happy silver medalist. It was really, really fun. My friend Matt, 
who is also a Methodist minister up in Washington State now. But in those days, um, as much as we were friends, Matt never had a good thing to say about me. <laughs> he said it was the best race he'd ever seen in his life. I mean, who am I to argue with Matt? Therefore, let us lay aside every weight and sin that clings, and let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. Sometimes we feel in our lives of faith that we are on our own. We're the only one who's going through this. We are the only one who knows what is happening. We're not on our own. We're not alone. There are a cloud of witnesses, a stadium full of people who have run this race before us and who can't wait to see us finish well. Amen. Our hymn of celebration invites us to be mindful of the presence and purpose of God. God of love and God of power is our hymn. Let us stand and sing with joy together. Now may the grace of God surround you, may the love of Christ sustain you, and may the Holy Spirit strengthen you this day and always. Amen. Amen.